Well, Jesus told many parables while living on this earth. You probably could tell that because this is now the uh, 12th lesson in our series on the parables and there's no, no end in sight, really. Um, some of the parables that Jesus taught are fairly easy to preach on. Sort of a straightforward message and everything is good and obvious and everything. Others are a little bit more difficult to preach on. Um, the one that we're going to look at tonight is in the latter category. Uh, <laughs> I mean, um, in fact, I uh, very seriously considered not preaching on the parable that I'm going to preach on tonight. Uh, and quite honestly, you would have never known the difference, would you? I mean, because it, it's, it's, you know, it's another parable. There are other parables that won't make it in this series and everything. But, uh, but I decided, because quite simply, it's one of the hardest parables of Jesus to understand. Thus, it's pretty tough to preach on. But I asked myself, what kind of preacher would you be if you only preached on the easy parables of Jesus? And the answer that I came up with is, I might be a good politician, but I wouldn't be a good preacher. So therefore, we're going to go ahead and, and look at this lesson tonight. In many ways, the most puzzling parable of Jesus is the parable of the shrewd manager, found in Luke 16, 1 through 13, if you want to turn in your Bibles there. It's puzzling because of the surface message it seems to be putting forth. Uh, when we dig a bit deeper, though, we find that the true meaning of the parable is not exactly what the surface would, would make you think it is. Let's look at Luke 16, 1 through 13. He said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a, a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this I, that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management. For you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. It would seem, we just read it, it sounds an awful lot like this parable is about the rewards of dishonesty. And they, right, right, just on the surface, that's what it sounds like. But then, I mean, after all, the manager was dishonest. He got caught, was fired, was dishonest some more, and then was rehired and praised by the rich man who had fired him in the first place for being dishonest, and his praises were about the man's dishonesty. It just, you know, that, uh, that, that what it, that's what it sounds like. But we know that Jesus would never support something like that. That would never be the focus of one of his parables. He wouldn't want people to think about being dishonest. And we know that if, well, if you only like to read the Bible, that may be the message that you get out of, out of this parable. I prefer, though, to dig a little deeper into the text. And by digging deeper, what I mean is I prefer to read what other people, more knowledgeable than myself, 
think of the, the text is saying and then drawing my own conclusions. As far as this mysterious text goes, I believe that there are three points, uh, three lessons for us, and they're fairly easy to remember. Verse 8 is the first one, verse 9 is the second one, and verse 10 is the third one. That's pretty easy to remember, right? Go ahead and fill, it, fill out your, form, your, your sermon notes and everything with the th main points. But let's begin with the first of those, verse 8, where Jesus says, For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Sounds pretty complex. But really when we read about that and we talk about the sons of this world are being shrewd, it's talking about the characters in the story. So let's look at, look at the characters in the story. The first one that we want to look at is the manager. The manager is obviously not a very high moral character. Um, he cheated his boss every chance he got. And apparently he had been doing so for a while. He got caught. He got fired. And so uh, he cheated again so that he wouldn't have to make an honest living. You know, he says, oh, well, here's what I'll do. I'll do this so that people will help me out and they'll receive me when I, I'm not the manager anymore. So that they'll be nice to me, that they'll, that they'll give me things so that I don't have to work for a living, basically. And then the other main characters in the story are the debtors. And the debtors are obviously not a very high moral character either. Uh, when given the chance, they cheat. When the manager that has been fired comes to him and says, how much do you owe my, ma my master? Oh, I owe 100 uh, barrels of oil. Okay, well, uh, quickly take your bill, sit down and make it 50. And, and so forth. they're more than happy to do it. They're excited about it. Hey, I don't have to pay exactly what I, this is good. You know, a good way to, to raise the credit score, so to speak. I guess they were ones who subscribe to the age-old theory and life philosophy, win if you can, lose if you must, but always cheat. You know, they, they were going to cheat however they could so that they got, if they, if they didn't get hurt, then it must be okay. Doesn't matter if somebody else got hurt. Doesn't matter if the master doesn't get back what he had loaned them or the agreed upon amount. It didn't matter to them. I remember way back when I was in high school, I was a student trainer for the football team. And uh, one of the uh, players had, he played center for the team, and he had his knuckles taped uh, with white athletic tape uh, just you know, to protect his hands and everything. It, when you're in that, that line there, apparently there's some pretty nasty stuff that goes on. I don't know. But anyway, um, so anyway, after he had his, his hands, his wrist taped, I was, or his knuckles taped, I was still in the training room taping someone else's ankle, and he said, hey, Carl, give me a black marker. What do you need a black marker for? Yeah, whatever. So I, I asked the asked the the, the uh, trainer. I said, "Where's the black marker? You know, Chris needs it. He's, oh, it's over there on my desk." So I went and got it for him, gave it to him, and he started coloring that white tape black. And I said, "What are you doing?" He said, "Well, I'm coloring it black so that I can hold without the referee seeing it as as obviously." Uh, great, so I just helped you cheat. That's wonderful, you know. But uh, uh, apparently it worked well for him because he went on. He didn't necessarily play professional football in, in the NFL, but in Europe somewhere where they have a professional league of American football, he, he played in that league. So he was a pretty good player. But anyway, the, the point is, you know, that uh, there are some people who are just not a very high moral character. <laughs> And most of the time, they're, they're, they're characters who are in the world, the sons of this world. Now then, what is the lesson from the characters, though? From looking at these, these, these dishonest people, what, what message does it have for us? Well, is the uh, message that Christians aren't shrewd nor treated shrewdly by other Christians? No, that's not the message. That's not what he's talking about. Notice that these characters, they were wholehearted in their illegal activity. They were all in, we might say. They, they were committed to being dishonest. The manager was willing to bend every rule, if not break 
every rule in order that they that he could get ahead in, other, in order to maintain his level of comfort the debtors were willing to do whatever it took to lower their debt so they, they have this this philosophy of whatever it takes Whatever it takes for me to come out on top, for me to get ahead, for me to maintain my lifestyle of comfort, whatever it takes, that's what I'm going to do. I think the lesson we take from that is that we should be the same way with our Christianity. Not we're going to cheat people to make them become Christians. Not we're going to bait them into thinking, oh, it's easy to live the Christian life, and then you know, they're going to find out, oh, whoops, it's not. If, but uh, we ought to have the philosophy of whatever it takes to spread the gospel. Now, obviously, whatever it takes doesn't mean changing the gospel. It doesn't mean saying things are true that the, that the Bible says are not true. It doesn't, doesn't mean contradicting the Bible. It means teaching the Bible and doing whatever it takes to make true and genuine disciples of Jesus. If Christians were as keen, as, um, uh, uh, saw as important about their Christianity as these men were on their dubious business dealings, we'd live in a different world. If we had that whatever-it-takes attitude about spreading the gospel, we'd do whatever it takes to spread the gospel. If we would, uh, just to you know, step on my own toes for a moment here, if we'd go to as much trouble be in being a Christian as we do to lower our handicap at golf, so to speak. I mean, or, or, or growing our roses, or going fishing, or you know, whatever our favorite pastimes are. If we spent as much time, if we were as dedicated to our Christianity, how much different would our lives be? They'd be a lot different, I'm sure. So how do you figure out? What's most important to you? How, how, well, you, you do a simple little test, okay? An easy test. You figure out the amount of time that you spend on outside activities, hobbies, sports, gardening, whatever, fishing, wh whatever your, those outside activities are. You figure out then the amount of time you spend on church-related activities, studying the Bible. Uh, read, uh, praying, church attendance, serving others, things of that nature. And then you compare the two. So here's what you do. There are 168 hours in every week. Okay? Most people who are of working age work 40 hours. That leaves 128. If you spend eight and a quarter hours a night sleeping or something like that, you know, just being generous there for, for some. But uh, uh, eight and a quarter hours of sleep each night, that's 58 hours total. That leaves 70 hours. 70 hours in the week. So where do they go? Do they go more toward church-related activities, spiritual development, or do they go toward the fun things in life that there are things that we consider to be fun, our hobbies, etc.? I think what Jesus is saying here is that look at the way worldly people work for the things that they value. If you would work at your Christianity with the same enthusiasm, you'd be a much better people. So that's verse 8. Now we turn our attention to verse 9. Make friends for yourself that, uh, by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Now, this statement can be taken two ways, okay? And it's pretty obvious the two ways that it can be taken. Number one is, it can be taken the way it sounds. So how does it sound? Well, the way it sounds is that Jesus is saying, use your money, your influence, your power to get people to do what you want them to do, to influence people. Use those things that you have, the abilities that you have to get other people to do what you want them to do. Kind of like the manager did. He used his position to, quote unquote, help others. I mean, when you're, somebody's in debt and you cut their debt in half or you cut their debt to, by 20% or whatever, you know, you're helping them out a little bit, right? Well, who was the manager really helping? He was really helping himself or trying to help himself. Um, 
In other words, uh, if we take it this way, Jesus is saying, hey, be a, be a politician. You know, and keep making promises that uh, there's no way you can keep and do whatever benefits you the very most. That, you know, that's, that seems to be what politicians do. That's one way this statement can be taken. Obviously, that's not the way it should be taken, I don't think. There's the way it is meant that it can be taken. To understand the way it is meant, we need to look at some other passages. Matthew 19.21, when Jesus is talking to the rich young ruler, and the rich young ruler says, What good thing must I do to have eternal life? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And then another passage, Luke 12, 33 and 34. Uh, Jesus is talking about do not worry, or Luke's account of do not worry about life. Look at the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. And Jesus says, sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I think the point that Jesus is making in these two verses and in verse 9 is don't let dollars drive you. Don't let everything be about the bottom line. The friends that you get may be the quote-unquote less desirables in life, but the reward that you gain, well, the reward that you gain just might be eternal. So the statement can be taken two ways, the way it sounds or the way that it's meant, or the way that I believe it's meant anyway. Money can be taken three ways. It can. One way is we can see money as an enemy. Refuse to have anything to do with it. Kind of like the hermits of the desert. Refuse to possess anything. You know, uh, it's, e it's easy to see money this way when you don't have it, okay? I mean, it's very easy to see it th that way. <laughs> yeah, I don't like money. That's why I don't have, an have any or whatever. But anyway, you know, uh, people who feel this way might say, well, you know what the good book says? Money is the root of all evil. I had somebody actually tell me that one time. I said, are you sure that's what it says? Absolutely. Where does it say that? I don't know. So well, I, I do know that 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 says that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And they just looked at me like I was stupid. But uh, yeah, anyway, the, the point is, you know, some people see money as an enemy. There are, there's one thing, though, that proves that Jesus was not like that. Consider that Jesus was 30 years old when he started his official ministry, Luke 3.23 tells us. What had he been doing those 30, uh, 30 years? He was the village carpenter of Nazareth, Mark 6.3 tells us. Many scholars believe that Joseph died young and that Jesus took it upon himself to support the family until his younger brothers had grown up enough to, to take on the business. There is in fact a legend that he made the best ox yokes in all of Galilee and that the people came from all over that part of the world uh, to buy the yokes that Jesus made. Village shops in Palestine were known to have signs swinging over their doors that told what type of business they were in. It has been suggested that the sign over the shop of Jesus, the carpenter of Nazareth, was... My yokes are easy. The Greek word for easy, by the way, can also mean well-fitting. Jesus was so conscientious in business that he never made an ill-fitting yoke that might hurt the shoulders of the patient oxen. Jesus accepted the problems of serving the public and of making a living. He would never have dismissed material things as things with which a Christian must have nothing whatsoever to do with. So we don't need to see money as an enemy. Well, another way we can see money is we can see money as master, as the boss. And we must be the slave of money. We judge everything by the bottom line, by how much it costs. Um, and this can be taken one of two extremes. 
You can be the miser who refuses to spend money on anything because it's not worth it and you don't want it and it's just, it's just you need to hoard your money. Or you can go to the other extreme and, uh, and uh, be one who doesn't care how he makes his money or her money just so long as it's rolling in. And that's all that matters to you. It doesn't matter if you make it honestly or dishonestly. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you have it. Of course, verses 13 through 15 talk a little bit about this. Look at uh, verse uh, 13 again. We read it earlier. Then we'll go into the next uh, section here. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. So the Pharisees, they, they, they kind of loved money. And they kind of took exception to what Jesus is saying here. So if money is not to be seen as an enemy, and money is not to be seen as a master, how can money be, how are we to see and look on money? Well, look on money as a friend. And as a friend, we use it wisely and unselfishly. We gain material things in this life and we use them to help others. Uh, we use them to, to assist others as, as best we can. If we use material things rightly, we will neither despise them nor worship them, but we will use them to bring strength, beauty, and comfort to our own lives and to the lives of others. So that, that I think, is how we need to see money. And I think that's the point that Jesus is making here in verse 9 about uh, using the, the uh, worldly wealth to... to uh, uh, make friends. Then finally, we come to verse 10. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And the opposite is true. One who is not faithful in little is not faithful in much. What he's saying here, I believe, is if we show ourselves untrustworthy, no one will trust us. Have you ever noticed how long it takes to build someone's trust? And how quickly it takes to lose their trust? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's fairly obvious uh, that that's true. If, but uh, the story is told of a manager who acted just like this manager in the parable. Okay, he was cheating his boss and he got fired. And so he decided he was going to do what the, what the, what the Bible said to do. So he started calling in people who owed his, the, the boss money and telling him to cut it in half and, and, and chop it down and everything like that. And he thought he was being pretty cool. Well, he did get fired and he did lose his job. And he decided he was going to open up a, a, a practice on his own in the same business that his that, that his former employer was in. He, he was going to, to really stick it to him that way and everything because he had, he had bought a lot of friends with his actions before he was fired. Trouble is, nobody ever trusted him again. And even though they, they had benefited from his dishonesty, they saw him as a dishonest person. And they weren't going to, going to ever trust him again. But if we show ourselves trustworthy, then everyone will trust us. If we can handle worldly wealth, then God can trust us with true riches. If we show ourselves to be true, good stewards now, then the reward will come later. Now, when I say reward, naturally, we see dollar signs, right? Not necessarily a material reward. I mean, the, the reward that you receive for being trustworthy might just be earning the trust of a parent or of a friend. It's been said that while Calvin Coolidge was growing up, his father would often leave to go to town. When he left, he would give 
Calvin Coolidge, he would give him a, a list of things that he was to have done by the time the father returned. Strangely, strangely though, whenever the father returned from town, he never, he never checked to see if the things had been done because he knew he could absolutely rely on Calvin to do them. That's how people need to see us, as absolutely reliable. They need to, we, we need to be conscientious in the business dealings that we engage in when we're in the world. We need to be conscientious about how we talk about friends when they're not around, or how we talk about even people who have made it clear that they really don't like us. We need to be careful how we talk about them. We need to be people that, 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 that others see as trustworthy. Because if we are, then when we start to talk to them about things that really do matter, like eternity, they'll be much more inclined to listen to us. So while this is a strange parable, I believe it is an applicable parable. Jesus wants us to be wholehearted in our service to him and all that we do. He wants us to use the material things that we have in a way that is pleasing to him. And he wants us to be faithful with the few little things that we have now so that he can pass along true riches to us eventually after, after our life is over. So what type of manager are you with the blessings that you've been given? Have you been loyal to the master or have you not been a faithful servant? Have you been paying, have you been paying care, more careful attention to the way that you live your life so that you are faithful and pleasing to the Master? If not, something needs to change. And that something that needs to change needs to change soon. We're not guaranteed that there's going to be a tomorrow. We're not guaranteed that there'll be a tomorrow for us personally or for the world. So what is it that you're waiting on? Why are you waiting to make those changes? Why are you waiting to make things right between you and God? The smartest, shrewdest thing that you could possibly do is to make things right between you and God right now. Maybe that's in a private response, a, a, asking God through prayer to, to bless you and to, to help you be more faithful in serving Him. Maybe it requires a public response. Whatever that need is, whatever that response must be for you to leave here knowing that things are absolutely 100% right between you and God, make that response. If we can help you through a public response, then won't you come to the front now as we stand and sing together.